Okay, we are back. Let's go into the next lab that we're going to do. <clears throat> It's going to be on uh, the last one we did was stellar explosions, novae, and supernovae. And now we're going to do neutron stars and pulsars. So the lives of stars are generally thought to end in either one of three ways. They either turn into white dwarfs. So we talked about those before on the last lab, white dwarf stars, black holes, or neutron stars. How a star ends its life depends on its mass. A star that ends with about one solar mass will turn into a white dwarf. Remember that we saw that the maximum mass of a white dwarf is 1.4 solar masses, and that was known as the Chandrasekhar limit. <clears throat> so now, while a star that ends with more than approximately 2.5 times the mass of the sun will collapse into a black hole. So black hole will be about 2.5 to 3 times heavier than the sun, or anything heavier. In between, we have another exotic category known as the neutron star. The Crab Nebula shown here is a remnant of a massive star that exploded in the year 1054 and left behind an extremely dense object known as a neutron star. So the neutron star here is somewhere in the center, but we don't really know here exactly which one it is. So this lab looks at the extra extraordinary properties of neutron stars, the dense balls of neutrons that may remain after some stars have exploded. Later, the lab examines pulsars, neutron, stars, neutron stars that appear to emit radiation in rapid pulses. Okay. So discovery. Let's always go to the first page here. So pattern, pulsars are a particular manifestation of a neutron star that sends out a very precise repeating pattern of pulses of electromagnetic radiation. So basically the pulsars are happen to be when the star is spinning and it's sending out this electromagnetic radiation. Neutron stars were first theorized to exist in the 1930s while pulsars were observationally proven to exist in the 1960s. However, we shall soon see that pulsars are a particular manifestation of a neutron star. And it is therefore impossible to discuss one without discussing the other. A signal from a typical pulsar shows noticeable peaks at very space, regular spacings, usually less than a second. The discovery of pulsars was made by graduate student Jocelyn Bell and her advisor, Anthony Hewish, in 1967. They were studying quasars with a radio antenna array in Cambridge, England. Jocelyn Bell was responsible for operating the antenna array and analyzing the data. In November 1967, Bell found a peculiar repeating pattern in the data that didn't resemble a quasar source. It was a pulse repeating with a period of uh, about 1.34 seconds. So these are the periods of some of the binary uh, the pulsars that we've discovered. <clears throat> the First pulsar was discovered by, well, right now, the, another name for it is PSR 1919-21. And the period was 1.34 seconds. So that means there will be a spike in intensity of the pulsar every 1.34 seconds. Uh, the Vela pulsar is 89 milliseconds, it repeats. <clears throat> so this M means millisecond. The Crab pulsar, was uh, 33 milliseconds. Uh, and the binary, uh, this is a binary uh, pulsar, is 59 milliseconds. Bell and Hewish spent considerable effort in investigating all sorts of possibilities for the signal. Since it was found in the same place in the sky day after day, it had to have a celestial origin instead of being an Earth-based interference. 
For a while, they even considered that the signal was an extraterrestrial communication and nicknamed it LGM, which was short for Little Green Men. So imagine the signal that's, that's rising every 1.34 seconds. It can be easily confused with a possible extraterrestrial life form maybe trying to communicate to us. Hewish and Bell found several other such objects in the following weeks, all pulsing with different periods. They were clearly naturally occurring objects and the name Pulsar was adopted, which was a contraction of Pulsing Star. <clears throat> pulsing Star. Okay. Pulsar sizes. The sizes of a pulsar is limited by how long it takes to change its brightness. In particular, the maximum size of an object producing these pulses was found to be approximately 300 kil kilometers. So imagine these guys are the remnants of dying stars, but they're the size of like a 300 kilometer. So that's very small, like about 200 miles. So that's a, that's a very, very small distance. So you're talking something heavier than 1.4 solar masses about typically about two solar masses, but the size of like 200 miles across, you know? So that's very, very small. The, na <clears throat> the nature of the pulses lets astronomers to an understanding of their source. The first few discovered pulsars had very regular periods between 0.3 and four seconds. Remember the first one was uh, 1.34 seconds. So it's in between that range. Pulsars could not be normal pulsating stars with such rapid rates of pulsation. The extremely regular arrival of the pulses suggests a, rotated ob a rotating object. Yet such objects couldn't be normal spinning stars with such high rates of rotation. <clears throat> so here it says here, the animation helps to understand the connection between the size of an object and the time required for the object to change in brightness. Press the play button to get each next step of the animation. So object observed at constant brightness. Okay, then it says photons leave point A and B of the object. So A and B, the photons are leaving, then they're coming. So now there's a spike in brightness until the back end arrives. And then the spike lasts until it dies down again. So this T here, the photon arrives from point A, arrives at detector. So time taken for complete rise in brightness to be uh, observed. T is equal to D over C. So that means the, the, from when the point A, the, the an electromagnetic radiation from point A arrives, to the point where point B also arrives, that's the time of the, the spike from here to all here, that's T, right? So that's T is equal to the diameter of the object divided by the speed of light. So from there, we can then calculate, if we know the how long the spike is taking, we can calculate the diameter, an approximate value for the diameter of the object. Let's see here. I think that's it for that. It just goes back to the beginning and rewinds. So now, so now you have uh, the, the photons are leaving, the front end arrives, then the back end. So it says here, the pulses themselves last only one thousandth of a second. Okay, so one thousandth of a second. This period constrains the size of the object producing the pulse. An object's intrinsic brightness cannot change considerably on a time scale shorter than the time it takes light to travel across its diameter. Thus, the diameter of the pulsars is of a limited size. So you take the speed of light expressed as kilometers per second, then multiply by the length of the pulse, 0 0.001 second. So then that's gonna be uh, 300 kilometers per second. 
sorry, I mean, I meant 300 kilometers is the maximum size of a neutron star, the maximum size. In comparison, such an object is noticeably smaller than the state of Ohio. So pulsars are neutron stars. Neutron stars are the extremely dense leftover of medium mass stars that died in extremely violent explosion called the type two supernova. Okay, so type two supernova is when a heavy mass star explodes. And then one of the possible remnants that he can leave behind is a neutron star, okay? This extremely small size led astronomers to conclude that pulsars were neutron stars, remnants left behind by the explosions of massive stars. The existence of neutron stars had been proposed in 1934 by Walter Bodd and Fritz Zwicky. They suggested that when a massive star forms an iron core, the core eventually becomes unstable and collapses. The collapse rebounds at a very high density, sending a shock wave out through the star that destroys it in a type two supernova explosion. However, theoretical calculations suggested that an extremely dense remnant might remain at the core. The, the asymmetric shock wave around neutron star PSR J0437 illustrates the high velocity some neutron stars receive from their birth in a supernova explosion. The neutron star not visible is a companion of the white dwarf visible at the center of the bow shock. So this must be right here, a white dwarf right here, a white dwarf star that has died. Uh, so right here, you see, the white dwarf star. And then there's a companion next to it, they're saying, that is uh, a neutron star. So the neutron star is a companion of the white dwarf visible at the center of the Boshock, which is caused by winds from the neutron star hitting material of the interstellar medium. The collapsed core is sufficiently dense enough to force the merging of protons and electrons into neutrons. So basically uh, what a neutron star is, is essentially, um, just a whole huge bed of neutrons. The protons have all been forced to become, to convert into neutrons in a neutron star. Due to the dense, the high density and gravity of a neutron star, all the protons that it has, most of them have been converted into a neutron. <clears throat> Merging, you see, if you merge the proton and an electron, you essentially get a neutron. So imagine forcing an electron and a proton to join together under a great force of gravity, and then you can possibly change that to a neutron. A neutron star, a ball of neutrons, the size of a city held together by gravity is formed. Pulsar exercise. Okay, I think this one is just a question essentially. What was the most distinctive property that led to the discovery of pulsars? You answer it and then you take a picture of it and that's it, basically. Nothing like calculational based. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, then we go here. Properties of the neutron stars. Okay, in the lighthouse model of pulsars, Strong magnetic fields cause charged particles to emit, to emit beams of radiation, which are then swept around by the neutron star's rapid rotation. The pulses of light, oh, oh sorry, sorry. We need to go to the first, the, first, um, the first page again. Make sure, hold on. Yeah, so we start out with the first page. Incredibly dense. Neutron stars have incredibly high densities, much greater than anything seen within our solar system, uh, within our solar system, much less on Earth. A piece of a neutron star material, the size of a mold spore. So imagine that piece of a neutron star, 30 microns has the same mass as a 20 ton truck. So imagine what density that is. So neutron stars have masses greater than that of the sun, yet each is only about the size of large earth city. 
This implies that they have very high densities. We can estimate a typical density given that the average mass of a neutron star is about 1.4 solar masses. Remember, that's the lowest mass that they could possibly have, 1.4 solar masses. Anything lower than that, then they are actually a white dwarf. But greater than 1.4, then they are a neutron star. Uh, and then they are typically about 10 kilometers in radius. So then you say 1.4 times the mass of the sun divided by 4 thirds pi times the radius of a neutron star cubed. So that's 1 times 10 to the 15 gram per cubic centimeter. That's crazy. The upper limit for a neutron star's mass is not precisely known, but is estimated to be around 2 and a half solar masses. So that means this mass here can be as big as two and a half solar masses right here. Angular momentum. The high rate of rotation of neutron stars is explainable based upon the principle of conservation of angular momentum. The original star rotated very slowly, but was very big. As the star collapsed, the speed of rotation had to increase in order to account for the decreasing radius of the star. The compact size of a neutron star also leads to a very rapid rates of rotation. This can be explained by a principle of physics known as the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum is a property of objects that are rotating or revolving and is described mathematically by the formula shown here. Angular momentum is the mass times the angular speed times the radius squared, okay? So that's the equation for angular momentum, approximately equal to the mass times the angular speed <laughs> times the uh, radius squared. The, the radius is the distance from the axis of rotation. For example, if you use this formula to calculate the angular momentum of the Earth going around the sun, the radius would be 1 AU. So angular momentum is conserved quantity. And therefore, if the radius decreases, the angular speed must increase, keeping the total angular momentum the same. The rotational period of the progenitor parent star's core is likely to have been several weeks, typical for high mass stars. By the time the core contracts down to approximately 10 kilometers in size, it must rotate very rapidly. So what they're showing you here is a simulation of the principle of the angular momentum conservation. If you take two weights and you bring in the, their distance, as you make the star collapse, it's gonna rotate faster, you see, to conserve angular momentum, like that, you see? So this is a principle from physics, angular momentum conservation. So because neutron stars are the collapse of the cores of their parent star, the parent star might be spinning once every couple of weeks. Like for example, our sun spins once every uh, about 25 days, <clears throat> okay? But once it, if it collapses into a white dwarf, it's also, it, its rate of spin will also increase. But the neutron star, the rate of uh, increase will be even more because the neutron star is the size of a city. So it's much, much smaller than even the white dwarf star. So the lighthouse model. In the lighthouse model, strong magnetic fields cause charged particles to hit beams of radiation, which are then swept around by the neutron's rapid rotation. The pulses of light that we associate with pulsars result directly from being in the path of one or both of these beams. Neutron stars also have incredibly strong magnetic fields. The original field of the progenitor star's core is greatly increased by its collapse. The magnetic field lines are much closer together, creating a field that could be 10 million times stronger than any on the Earth. The neutron star resembles a giant magnet with north and south poles. Note that like the Earth, the neutron star's magnetic axis is generally not aligned with its rotational axis. Uh, this is important because such a magnetic field could indirectly accelerate charged particles nearby to very high velocities. 
These particles then emit radiation in beams along the neutron star's magnetic poles. As the neutron star rotates, the beams rotate as well, sweeping through space just like the beam from a lighthouse. The only difference between what is observed as a pulsar and is what is observed as a neutron star is orientation. Are we in the right position to see the beams or not? This model is known as the lighthouse. Uh, and Anthony Huish uh, shared the 1974 Nobel Prize in Physics for developing this explanation. In other words, what they're saying is, if a lighthouse is directed towards us and we see the brightness, then we call that a pulsar. But if the lighthouse is not directed towards us, it's still a pulsar, but we don't see the pulses. And then just we call it a neutron star, but they're the same thing really. Okay, so here, um, show axis. Oh, okay, so the red is the rotational axis and the blue is the magnetic axis. And here, let's see here. We could, uh, we could change the angle of inclination. Oh, you see here. So inclination, if, if it's 90 degrees, you see here, I made it 90 here. That means it's up and down. That's the inclination of the rotational axis of the star. And then the magnetic axis is the blue line. If it's zero degrees, that means the magnetic axis coincides with the, uh, the magnetic axis. If it's zero degrees here, then the magnetic axis coincides and is the same as the rotational axis. If this is 90, look what happens. If it's 90, then the magnetic axis is 90 degrees. So how many beams would we see here? We would see one and then second one. So it's like, you know, if, if this was like a actual lighthouse, you know, like that. Now, if it was oriented like this, what would happen? Let's say like this, would we see the beams? Not really, right? None of them are facing us. So we would call this a, a neutron star. Why? Because we're not seeing any pulses, but it's still a pulsar. It's still a neutron star. They, they're the same thing, but depends on if it's facing us or not. So you can experiment with different, um, let's see here, you can experiment with different, oh, period is just how fast it's rotating. If you make the period 20, it's gonna take to like 20 seconds to rotate once. So it's a slow rotating pulsar. Oh, this is fast rotating. So imagine if we go back to making the inclination uh, 90, Yeah, how many pulses do we measure? Well, we would need a computer to read this. We would have a spike, 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 you know, every time that it's facing us. So you can now try, oh, the other thing that this does is um, you could experiment with the cone angle. What does the cone angle mean? You see, a sharp cone angle is the cone angle of the magnetic field. You see here, like that. That's a 15 degree cone angle for the magnetic field. So this is the radiation is emitted along the cone angle of 15 degrees. Whereas uh, this one, cone angle of uh, five degrees, you see. But now you could practice different things. Like what if the inclination of the magnetic field was like this? See, I'm not changing the rotational axis now. I'm only changing the, hold on, let's, let's keep the inclination 90. You see, so I'm keeping the red vertical up and down, and now I can change the magnetic axis. Any of, the, any of them facing us? Not, not really, right? 
it's got to directly face us. Otherwise, we don't see a rise in. So, yeah, we don't see anything. How about if I did this way? I can make it so that one of them faces us. Hold on, let's see. There you go. Let's make the cone angle bigger. Yeah, you see right there? Uh, let's make it. Yeah, uh, it's kind of not clear if it's facing us. I think this one faces us. Yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. I think that one faces us. So by trying different combinations of the inclination axis and the magnetic axis, you can have one of the beams facing us. You can have both beams facing us. And you could have neither beam facing us. You see? Now, what if the inclination was 0 and the magnetic axis was 90? That means the star would actually be pointing towards us, but it would shoot beams of light this way. Well, now, yeah, this is still not a pulsar because we're not seeing any beams. So uh, inclination 0. And the magnetic 90, nothing. We don't see a pulsar. It's got to be the other way around. This has to be 90. Now we see it. And then if this is 0, we still don't see anything. So the best one that we can see two beams is if that's 90 and this is uh, 90. Now, if it's 180, yeah, we still don't see anything. Yeah, so it's kind of fun to see the different combinations of what they lead to. Okay, so now, uh, okay, open the Pulsar Explorer above to view a simulation of a Pulsar using the Lighthouse model. Experiment with the simulator, then explore each of the three Pulsars and their associated attributes. So they're giving you actual Pulsars here. Magnetic axis angle, 37. Inclination, 41. Cone angle, 7. Uh, pointed towards me. Neither of the pulsar beams, one of the pulsar beams, both pulsar beams. So what you would do for those is take two pictures uh, to show that if you, if you think that both beams face us, you know? So if you have some combination, let's say, like this, some weird combination that they gave you. So uh, I think on that one, the pulsar period doesn't matter, right? So you can make the pulsar period slow so that you take your time. So now take a picture. Can we stop it? Hold on. I think there's a way to stop this. Animate pulsar. Yeah. Okay. So you just go like this. And then you take a, you click the animate pulsar. Right there. Right there. So do you, you say, do you, do you think this is facing us? So you take a picture of this. And based on this, you say, do you, do you think this is facing us? Well, I think the, it should face us if it's directly coming out of the paint. I don't think this is actually would face us. Let me see if it's cone angle. I think the cone angle probably affects the answer too, right? If the cone angle is like sharp, there's more chance that it won't face us. If, if the cone angle is wide, it might face us. Yeah, I'm not sure how the computer will accept the answer. I think the cone angle probably changes things too. So if I make something random, let's see, animate. Let's go a little faster. Okay, now does that face us? I think that one I would answer face us, 
because it's pretty much centered in the star. Uh, hmm. But I'm not 100% sure. So this one is going to be a little bit of exploration of how the how this uh, answer wants wants it. So I think one beam is facing us, I would say, but it might say even this is not facing us, but I think it is in my opinion. Uh, so then that would be one picture. And then the other picture would be for the other beam. Where's the other beam, that one. So, well, that one definitely doesn't face us, you see. It's all the way down there. So uh, let's see here. Only one of them possibly. So this this one or and then the other one does definitely doesn't face us. Right there. So then I would take uh, two pictures. One with the other cone facing us and one with this and say, okay, I believe this is only one of them facing us. And then you would answer that, you know, the first one. And then do the same two pictures for that one and two pictures for that one. So two, two snapshots for each one and then one snapshot for the whole answer. So it's a nice little exercise to determine if, in other words, would our computers notice a peak in the intensity of that pulsar. That's kind of what you're, you're trying to answer by looking at that pulsar. Would they experience a peak in brightness? Okay, so now uh, let's go to pulsar periods. Okay, let's go to the first page again. Okay, gradual change. Pulsars gradually slow down over time. For this reason, astronomers are interested in measuring a pulsar's period P as well as its change in period over time. Delta P divided by delta T. The Greek letter delta is used to denote a change in the quantity. So delta P is the change in the period or the final value P minus the initial value P. Delta P is P final over P initial. When pulsars were first discovered, it was suggested that they could be used as clocks since the pulses were so regular. However, we have now been observing pulsars for over 35 years with ever increasing accuracy. And then we know that their periods slowly change over time. So that means we can't use them as clocks. In fact, the two quantities that we are most interested in knowing for a pulsar are its period P and how fast the period changes with time, delta P divided by delta T. The next simulation will allow you to observe a pulsar over a period of 30 years, and you will measure both delta P over T and P. Okay, so now, okay, so now you have here, uh, so make, take measurement. So basically in the year 2000, what would be the, the, uh, the, the distance between each peak of these, you see, that's the period from one peak here to the next peak here. So then we take a measurement. Okay. And it says during the year 2000, it's 0.44668359 seconds. That means the peak from here to here is about a 0.44 seconds. So then we go to another year. Then we take measurement during the year 2000. Let's see, what year is that? Oh, 2001. So one year later, it should have slowed down. So that means this number should be slightly bigger than the previous number that it showed us. So it's slowing down, but not that fast, of course. So it's so now if we go to another year, let's say jump to 2010, it takes a while to generate the, the data. So once this graph appears, our simulation shows the data now. 
0.4466. Oh, where is it here? 2010. Well, it's taking a while to generate it. Where is the dot? It disappeared. Hold on, take measurement. Oh, okay. There it is. Okay, so we can we can point to any of them, and so see this is point four four six six eight three five nine, point four four six six eight three eight two. So as you see, it slowed down only in like the very very last digits, and then here, point four four six six eight five eight nine. Here, point four four six six eight three eight two. Yeah. So it's only changing in this in this digit, you see? 8589, so it's one, two, three, four, five, the sixth digit is changing. But of course, over millennia, that's still considerable change, right? It's slowing down. Uh, so let's see here. Take another data, take measurement. Take another data, take measurements. Oh yeah, you gotta press on the take measurements thing. Take measurements, take measurements, take measurements, click on them. Oh, okay, so yeah, it forms a straight line. Oops. Yeah. So actually, then it gives you the slope. Look at that. Spin down rate. Change in period. So you see, they're doing the difference of the periods divided by 30 years. You see? So that's uh, how many seconds per year that it's slowing down. So essentially, they did, they subtracted the two times. And it's you got the 0.44690, 0.446 over 20, 30 minus 20, so per year, but then they converted this year to seconds. So the units is seconds per seconds. It slows down these many seconds in these many seconds. <laughs> so it's, uh, they, they changed it to a second per second. Okay, so when the pulsar evolution simulator above, this shows a pulsar which changes over 30 years time, which you can see by changing. You can use the simulation to take measurements at different points, collect at least 10 different measurements, and then analysis tab will allow you to calculate the change in period. As time passes, the period of the pulsar increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. So then uh, just do like I did here with 10 measurements, and then... Um, you can answer this and then see what is the period P of the pulsar in the year 2000. Okay, so then uh, you would change, you would go over here and then 2000, you would click it here and then, oh, hold on, 2000, you would click it and it would show the period. So you could take a snapshot of that, uh, snapshot of that, then it would show the period and the year. So that'd be one snapshot. And then what is the period of the pulsar in the year 2030? So then uh, you would take another period for that. What is the average spin down rate of the pulsar between 2000 and 2030? So then take another snapshot of that, uh, 2000, and 2030 would be the last one. Right? And then you would take another picture of that. And then you would uh, take a snapshot of this, showing the spin down rate, the spin down rate. And then you would answer, put that answer here. And of course, I guess it should accept it, right? Uh, because they gave the spin down rate. <clears throat> so it sh uh, should accept it. So how many uh, snapshots there? For question one, you don't really need a snapshot. Question two, well, I mean, for question one, you need a snapshot, which is, your answer, submit the answer, and whether it was right or wrong. Then question two, you need a snapshot of the whole answer. Then you need uh, one, two, and then three. 
and then also show your work. So in showing your work, you're showing how they got this answer. So after you subtract, so your work will be similar to what they're showing here. You would subtract this time minus that time over the years, but then also show, once you get the year, show how to convert from the year to the second. So how did they do the conversion of the year to the second? And you also do show that calculation and then check to see if you get the same answer as what they got. So put it in your calculator and show what you what you are getting. You might get slightly something slightly different than what they're getting, but at least show how to do the steps. So this part would be similar, except now you would also show how to convert the year to the seconds and how to get an answer similar to this. Okay, I think that's it for that. The only two questions. Okay, next, glitches. Sometimes pulsars abruptly speed up a little bit before continuing the process of slowing down. Um, observations of pulsars show that all of them are slowing down. Thus, they must be losing rotational energy. They must be losing rotational energy. Calculations show that the energy from the beams of radiation are only a small part of this energy loss. The rest must be lost in the pulsar wind. I see, so it's complicated stuff are happening. So the, the pulses themselves are carrying the pulsars of the, the energy of the pulsar away. And then what's known also as a pulsar wind, charged particles, pro protons, electrons, and ions accelerated away from the pulsar into space. Pure, Pulsar periods increase steadily over time, but sometimes a sudden small decrease in period is observed. So you see the period is increasing, then drops. Then it goes up, increases, drops. So those are called glitches. Some young pulsars have exhibited abrupt decreases in periods by a few parts per million, known as glitches. Glitches were originally believed to be pulsar quakes the settling of the pulsar into a more compact form. Current theories explaining glitches are far more complicated. After a glitch, the pulsars continue slowing down. Distribution of pulsars. By making the plot of period versus spin down rate, a so-called pulsar period graph, by making the plot of period versus spin down rate, uh, we can discern the information on population of similar pulsars and how they possibly evolve. One way scientists analyze data is by plotting relationship between various quantities. In the adjacent diagram, we have a plot of period versus spin down rate for 562 pulsars. So the, yeah, you see, this is the periods of the pulsars. Hold on, so no, on the horizontal axis is the pulsar period right? And then the spin down rate is how fast the period is slowing down. So it looks like the, the slower the period, that means the longer it takes, the spin down rate is also large. So it's almost like a linear line you can draw through here, a linear graph. Uh, so from, from the pulsar period and spin down rate, we can infer quite a bit from approximately how old the pulsar is to how strong its magnetic field is. It's amazing how much we can do these kinds of things, right? So we use crosshairs, use age lines. Ah, so that means pulsars near this, this line, oops, pulsars near this line right here are about 1 million years old. Hold on, let's see here. To magnify this, you see, post, you see, ten to the ninth is a million years old. That means the pulsars in this line are um, one million years old. But because their pulsar periods are um, their spin down rates are hold on, ten to the minus twenty seconds per second. Uh, that means their spin down rate is not, for, so for the old ones, their spin down rate is not as much, it looks like. You see here, 
It's not as much as you, the younger ones, like look at these pulsars, a uh, thousand years. So that means, well, for a thousand years, mainly the periods are gonna be 10 seconds. So their only data are here. And there's some here. Oh, I can just put this on a particular, it tells you that here the period, the spin down rate, characteristic age, and magnetic field strength. So you show magnetic field strength. Oh, I see. Wow, it's an interesting graph. So as you go this way, from this green line, that way, the magnetic field strength is getting stronger. Then you go that, the magnetic field strength is even stronger and stronger, 10 to the 15th Gauss. <laughs> Just by way of comparison, the magnetic field of the Earth is about a uh, quarter Gauss. One, basically, it's about a one Gauss. Think of it that way. One Gauss is the magnetic field strength of the, at the surface of the Earth. So even the weakest of these pulsars, magnetic fields, is a billion Gauss, 10 to the ninth, a billion Gauss. That means even the weakest of these pulsars have a magnetic field one billion times stronger than Earth's field, Earth's magnetic field. Imagine that, one billion times stronger than Earth's field. You know, so this incredible, very, very strong uh, magnetic fields. Okay, so let's see her, mm, the distribution of periods exploration exercise. Using a pulsar period versus spin down rate interactive graph for the ranges of pulsar attributes, uh, Find the ranges of pulsar attributes and fill out the table below. Note, it may be helpful to zoom in, control plus on most browsers in order to more easily select the given point. Pulsar name, so what's the pulsar name? Shortest period, longest period, largest spin down rate, smallest spin down rate, and then the values. How many times longer is the longest period than the shortest period? So you probably need four, snapshots here, one, two, three, four, and then you put in the value of the, the, that here. Uh, how many times longer is the shortest period? So so basically you, you go pulsar name, shortest period. So shortest period, how what did you find shortest period? Shortest period will be all the way to the left here, the smallest period. That means that's the fastest rotating pulsar. Shortest period, is the one that has the smallest period here and it's the fastest rotating pulsar. So it should be this one. I think that one is the most left, but there is another several ones here like that are green. Hold on, let me see. If I zoom in on it, it's green, huh? It's between this green one or the red one. Oops, why is it? It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't let me go to the red. Hold on. Oh, now it lets me. So but now I gotta look up at this one. Period, magnet spin, down rate, shortest period. So there's nothing else on this left side. So I'm thinking either between this and this. So then if you click here, oops, you know, I gotta zoom out because I can't even see the top. Yeah, there you go, right there. Point zero, hold on. I've got to put this correctly. 0 0.00155 seconds. But it doesn't give you the name of the pulsar. So you take a snapshot of that, but then is that 0 0.00155? How about this one? Ooh. Hold on. Center it. 0 0.00162. I think the green one is the smallest period. 
Wow. Just by a small, so it's a faster rotating pulsar than this guy. So it is that one right there. So you take a snapshot, but how do we know it's named? Let's see, does it tell us pulsar name? Uh, alphanumeric input field. Oh, 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 it's just the pulsar name and the value shortest period. So the, the value would be the, what was it? 0 0.00155, right? And then the pulsar name, where would that be? Uh, I don't see the name anywhere. Hold on. Mm. Interactive graph. You can interact with the diagram in two ways. If you cro use crosshairs, check the crosshair replaces the cursor, and you can read off the period at spin down rate at each location. If you if you use crosshairs unchecked. Hovering the cursor over a point will show the properties of that individual pulsar. Oh. Oh, I see. Yeah, that was tricky. Oh, I see. So then if you don't check this, hold on, then you go over here. Oh, it tells you where the spin period. So if you do the cross here, it shows you period, spin down rate, characteristic age, my gosh, 400 and that would be like 478 billion years over there. Gosh, 417, 518 billion year, no, sorry, 518 million years old. That would be 518 million years old, 4.11 times 10 to the 8 Gauss. And remember, one about a one Gauss is Earth's magnetic field. It's actually even less than one Gauss, a quarter Gauss. Uh, okay, so the name would be like that. If you click on here, okay, so then crosshair. period 0 0.001607. Okay, and then the spin down rate. Uh, I think this one is the one we would need because it's got the name and it's in a binary system. So we don't know its companion, but it might be that it's a companion of two neutron stars. It could be two neutron stars, two pairs of neutron stars that are going around each other. So pulsar B1957 plus 20. So then if it's the green one is the answer. Oops. Oh, there it is. Oop. You know what, let me zoom in. Let's see if I could fit the. Yeah. When you zoom in, then the thing disappears. Okay, hold on. Why is it clicking? See if I click on another, let's say yellow one. The yellow one is easier to click on, yeah. Oh, that pulsar is in a globular cluster. Wow. Let's see this green one. See that green one is, I could easily point to. There it is. So this one should be, oh, here it is. There you go. Okay. So I think that one is shorter period, yeah than the other one. So you would take a picture of this and you don't have to show the crosshairs then for that and then show the uh, period. So then you would have another one for 
the longest period and what the value is, largest spin down rate, what the value is, smallest spin down rate, so four snapshots. How many times longer is the longest period than the shortest period? So then you take the ratio of this to this. For that one, just show how to do the calculation. Just divide the two. Divide the longest period by the shortest period, and you get a ratio, and then you put that here. So it's not that uh, there's no snapshot for that. I mean, there's a snapshot for the whole thing of how you did, of course, but for that one particular, just show the work. Question two. Using the pulsar period versus spin down rate in track graph, where do most pulsars reside on the graph? Uh, so that one, you would just take a one snapshot of the whole thing, focusing on just the whole thing. And then of course, you can uh, see that most pulsars are in the middle here. You see, even though there's a group here, but there aren't as many as here. So most of them lie in the middle of the age bracket and the period bracket and the spin down rate bracket. So one snapshot for that. Stars like our sun reside by themselves in a star system while the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is in a multiple star system. Is the typical pulsar in the lower left corner of the diagram more like the sun or a Centauri? So stars like our sun reside by themselves in the star. While the closest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is in a multiple star system. So Alpha Centauri is actually one of the brightest stars in the sky, and it's actually one of our closest stars. And they're saying that the Alpha Centauri is in a multiple star system. So is the typical pulsar in the lower left corner more like the sun or Alpha Centauri? So what would we have to do? we would have to, in the lower left corner, we would have to click several of them and then take pictures of that. So, okay, binary star system. Remember how we learned that about half the stars in the sky are a binary pair before when we were studying binary stars. So what we're learning here is that for some groups of pulsars, they're in the binary pair. And the other binary pair might be actually another pulsar as well. But it might be a regular star, you know. So uh, binary system, binary system. So probably take about four pictures there from different locations. Binary, right there. Another one, two, and then three. Overwhelmingly, it's binary, yeah. And then four, right there, binary. So about four or five pictures there are sufficient to show that most of these, how about the yellow ones? Let's see. Oh, globular clusters. Oh, okay, those are globular clusters. Globular clusters. Globular clusters. Yellows are globular clusters. Globular clusters, globular clusters. So the red ones would be the binary pairs. So you just take a random four or five pictures showing that those are binary pairs. So the yellows are globular clusters. That means the pulsar is in a globular cluster. The green ones are just individual pulsars in, at the center of like a supernova explosion, but it doesn't have any binary pair. So there's a lot of them that are individual. Yeah, regular, just regular pulsar, individual, no pair. How about these ones? Is an anomalous X-ray pulsar. Anomalous. Oh, it's an anomaly. That means it's kind of not ordinary. It emits a lot of X-rays. Uh, there must be a reason why they're also calling it anomaly. Uh, it's uncommon, that means. It's very uncommon. So its age is very young. Yes, a thousand years old. See, anomalous X-ray pulsar. Uh, 6.45. That's kind of very slow rate of rotation. 6.45 seconds. 
that's probably also another reason why they're calling it anomaly. The period of rotation is so slow, 10 seconds. Remember how at the beginning of the notes, it said something like the rate of rotation of pulsars is 0.3, 0.2 or 0.3, all the way to four seconds. I remember it said four seconds. These guys' ro ro period of rotation is more than four. So they're rotating very, very slowly. 6.98, 8.69, 10, 11. What about these purple ones? Is a soft gamma ray repeater. <laughs> I love that word. So it actually uh, emits gamma rays. And then what does soft gamma ray mean? Well, we have we would have that we would have to look that up. Uh, so soft gamma ray repeater. Anomalous X-ray pulsar, but even the soft gamma ray repeater, it's very slow rate of rotation. 5.16 seconds, soft gamma ray repeater. So those are kind of off to the side and they're very, very young pulsars. Thousand years old, that's crazy. That's like a baby for a star, little baby. Okay, so for this answer, you would just base it off of that uh, four to five pictures in the lower left corner. Let's see what else here, nothing here. Next one. Okay, one more, I think one more uh, assignment left. Oh, the pulsar period graph can also be analyzed, used to analyze different population of pulsars and to identify new, new pulsars based upon their measured periods and spin down rates. Pulsars that are part of a binary system or in globular clusters where binary companions would be available for capture are on the lower left of the diagram. Oh, you see that? So in the globular cluster, binary companions were readily available and the, the pulsar can capture one of them because bi globular clusters are these huge clusters of stars. So the star can easily capture a binary pair. These have very small periods with some as small as milliseconds, presumably because matter has streamed from the companion star onto the pulsar, thus increasing the rate, rotation rate. You see, so the matter that has accumulated on the uh, pulsar has accumulated from its companion, which has caused the rate of rotation to increase and therefore its period to lower. You see here, infolding matter spirals onto the surface of the neutron star, increasing its rate of rotation. Oh, so it's how the, the falling matter goes and that starts making it spin faster. So that's kind of makes sense why in this picture that uh, the ones that are very short period here are usually binary pairs or globular clusters. They can, they can uh, suck matter from their companion and then that could make them spin even faster. Okay, now these guys are the regular individual pulsars. And then these guys would be the anomalous ones. So towards the upper right of the pulsar period diagram are pulsars with specially powerful magnetic fields known as magnetars. These consist of anomalous X-ray pulsars, which pulse only in X-rays and not in radio waves, and soft gamma ray repeaters, which emit violent streams of gamma rays from time to time. So these are called magnetars. <laughs> it's almost seems something from like a comic book, like magneton. <laughs> Anomalous X-ray pulsars, they emit only X-rays. So let's see if we look at magnetars. Those would be in the top right corner. A magnetar is an exciting type of neutron star. It's defining feature that it is an ultra powerful magnetic field. The field is about a thousand times stronger than a normal neutron star. My gosh and about a trillion times stronger than the Earth's. Magnetars are by far the most magnetic stars in the universe. Wow. 
Look at those pictures. My gosh. Beautiful. Look at that. Now, some of this might be computer generated. They might not be exact uh, pictures, but oh boy, that is beautiful. Something if I'm uh, like a sci-fi movie. My gosh. I just love pictures like that. Uh, let's see if there's a video on that. In April 2020, astronomers detected an unusually bright and powerful radio signal never before recorded in our home galaxy. The source is a magnetar, a type of compact object with the strongest magnetic fields in the cosmos. Like pulsars and neutron stars, magnetars are the crushed cores left behind when a massive star explodes, but their super strong magnetic fields put them in a class by themselves. The fields are up to a thousand times stronger than typical neutron stars, and over 10 trillion times stronger than a refrigerator magnet. They can rip molecules apart from thousands of miles away distort the shapes of atoms, and store enormous amounts of energy. On April 27th, the magnetar, named SGR-1935, produced a rapid-fire storm of short, powerful X-ray bursts that lasted hours. The activity, first spotted by SWIFT, was also monitored by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope and the NICER X-ray Telescope on the International Space Station, along with other space missions. As the storm wound down early on April 28th, NICER recorded some 200 X-ray bursts in just 20 minutes. Later that day, SGR 1935 fired off another X-ray burst. This time, though, it was accompanied by something new, a powerful pulse of radio waves lasting a thousandth of a second. Chime, a radio telescope in British Columbia, led by several Canadian universities, discovered the signal and determined it came from the vicinity of SGR 1935. Another experiment, called STAIR-2, and operated by Caltech and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, wow. saw wow. an even brighter signal at different radio wavelengths. Since 2007, astronomers have been trying to understand the sources of powerful millisecond radio signals, called fast radio bursts, seen from other galaxies. Magnetars have been prominent suspects. The duration and energy release of SGR 1935's radio signal is closer to fast radio bursts than any other source. For the first time, astronomers saw a magnetar in our own backyard produce a signal only previously seen in other galaxies. The discovery strengthens the case that magnetars are responsible for at least some fast radio bursts. Data from NICER and Fermi on X-ray bursts at the end of the storm showed that they differed from the one that coincided with the radio signal. This event's characteristics set it apart from the other eruptions, and further study may provide clues about how it also powered the radio burst. Radio waves from normal pulsars originate high above their surfaces. Exactly where and how, we don't know. A big eruption could launch a cloud of plasma to high enough that a radio burst could form. Never before have astronomers seen fast radio bursts so close to home. It's just one more reason to watch the skies and to keep tabs on the strongest magnets in the universe. Wow. And again, like I've said before, there's so many great videos nowadays. And you guys can share all of these stuff in the discussion too, you know. Uh, get inspiration from all of this. Oh my gosh. Just amazing what's, how far science has come. Okay, I think that was it. This uh, lab didn't have much calculations, very little bit, huh? Okay, that's nice, I guess. <laughs> okay, but we still learned a lot, of course. A lot, lot, lot. Okay, bye-bye.